Okay. Um, well, we've heard a lot the last couple of days about how mischievous people can spread misinformation and disinformation more and more effectively through the news channels and how the technology for doing that is getting so good. Um, we, or I should say they, have come a long way from, perhaps you'll remember this example, from six years ago now when the AP Twitter feed got hacked um, to suggest that there have been explosions at the White House, um, $236 billion in value lost on the S&P within three minutes after that episode. And it should have been so obvious. I mean, this is the Associated Press Twitter feed, right? And they're not using AP style on the stuff they're putting in here. <laughs> Explosions should not be capitalized. It should say President <laughs> Barack Obama. Anyone would know it, but it, it worked. Um, but things have gotten so much better since then. Have you seen this mashup of Jennifer Lawrence and Steve Buscemi now using the deep fakes video? Can we um, play the sound on this? Um, I have a follow up about Amy Schumer. You guys said you were going to dress as twins this evening, and I'm yeah, but then I, I blew it. I blew it by talking about it because then if we did it, it would have been expected, you know. So we just wore our own thing. But I hope you were still satisfied. Kind of creepy, but pretty good, actually. What are you going to believe? So um, these are problems, of course. But uh, you know, what about those people or those journalists in particular who are trying to get it right? Not who are trying to fool us, but who are trying to get it right, who are trying to convey the best, most credible research-based evidence, but who, because maybe they're a general assignment freelancer or their newsroom has gotten gutted and there's no more specialty reporters left, they just don't have the science backgrounds themselves. They don't know the difference between an observational study and a randomized control study. They don't know about statistical significance versus trends, and they don't have a deep bench of science experts they can turn to for help. Or maybe they even are the last environment reporter on staff, but instead of having a story to do every day or two, they've got three stories to do in a day, and the online version of that first story is supposed to be on the web now, so they don't have time to find those amazing little nuggets of evidence that would transform this story from a simple, shallow, he said, she said, into something that truly helps readers or viewers make smarter, more informed decisions in their lives. It's these poor reporters who end up writing stories like these, well, like these, um, which believe me, I've looked at these studies, which are mostly on cells or mice, and they do not really give you a lot of hope for blueberries and cancer. Or stories like these, you remember this one maybe, when one astronaut went up in space for a year, the other stayed down, and supposedly their genomes at the end were 7% different. Well, you know, our <laughs> genomes and those of other great apes are 2% different. Um, cats I've seen are like 9 or 10% different. I don't think these two guys are 7% different. I'm sorry. Um, or stories like these, when supposedly a year ago, a brand new, never before seen gigantic organ was discovered in the human body that no one had ever seen before. I don't think so. Um, but it sure made a lot of news. So these are the reporters for print, for radio, for TV audiences that Cyline was created to help and who we are in fact helping now many times a day through an array of free services that are funded by a half a dozen philanthropies. Cyline was created a year and a half ago in part because as great as all these fact-checking organizations are out there that have sprouted like mushrooms in the last few years and they're wonderful to have out there, they are inevitably too little too late. And wouldn't it be great if we could get to the left of that, get upstream of that, and help people who are trying to get it right, get it right in the first place, so we don't have to be trying to correct things later. So how does it work? There's a few things we do. Our bread and butter day-to-day -day is our expert matching service. We haven't actually had any babies come out of this yet, but we'll see. <laughs> um, basically, you're a reporter, you're working on a story, you need some help from, a, from an expert or a scientist. You get in touch with us with a short form by email, you tell us what your story is about, what your deadline is, what kind of expert you need. We have a giant database of about 10,000 scientists now with a lot of details about their, uh, their scientific expertise and vetted for their communication skills. Very important. We could talk about that later, how we do that. Um, we, re we reach out to the scientists in our database who we think are the best match. We confirm with them that they, their expertise does indeed match the needs of this reporter and that they're available within that deadline, whether it's a few hours or a few days. And if so, we share their contact information with the reporter and the reporter can do their interview and we get out of the way and just let the journalism happen. Uh, apart from this service, we've also been producing fact sheets. These are super condensed designed for reporters who are hair on fire, under deadline pressure, 
just the facts bulleted that they can easily pluck and put into a story. If you've got an extra inch left in that story, here's a few things you can count on. We produce them in-house and we send them out to a half a dozen experts to make sure they're exactly right. And references are provided for those who want to dig deeper on them. You can see some of the topics that these are uh, available on our website uh, for reporters to look at. We also have been hosting media briefings. Uh, media briefings are held on a Zoom platform, so scientists in the comfort of their own offices get on. We get 40, 50 or more reporters on. The scientists make short presentations on a topic. There's live Q&A, and it's a great opportunity for reporters to get up to speed so they know how to report on some of the topics that you can see here. We're doing one tomorrow, actually, on, on vaping and health. We're also doing boot camps. So we just did a boot camp uh, about a week ago in Illinois, just about genomics, getting reporters up to speed on how genomics apply to various application fields. In agriculture, for uh, gene-engineered crops. In medicine, for personalized medicine. In criminology, in the way that uh, people are sending in their blood for a genealogy test and finding out that their uncle was a mass media, mass murderer. Um, you know. <laughs> It's good to understand this stuff if you're a reporter. Uh, so the genomics workshop happened. We're now planning our next boot camp, which is actually going to be for political reporters, which we're going to hold in Des Moines, Iowa in August in the lead up to the caucuses there. And the idea there is to give this nonpartisan background on science that will inform some of the issues that candidates are going to be talking about uh, in the lead up to the election. What are the facts about extreme weather and, uh, and climate change in the Midwest? What would it take to really switch over to renewables by 2030 or 2050, as some candidates are saying they would like to do? What are the links, according to the best peer-reviewed social science research, between immigration and jobs, immigration and the economy, immigration and crime, so that these political reporters, when they're asking questions of candidates or when they're listening to what the candidates are saying, can hold their feet to the fire because they'll know something about what the research base is behind these topics. So how are we doing? Uh, we're around for just over a year now, going on a year and a half. We've had nearly 500 requests now from reporters. 97.5% of the time, we've found them at least one expert within their deadline, which again, are often very short, um, that they can interview and that they have interviewed. We've, reviewed, we've referred more than 700 scientists, because we often refer more than one to a reporter. 80% of the stories that pop from these interviews quote directly at least one of the scientists we've referred, which we take as some indirect evidence that they're proving useful. Um, 150 participants in media briefings, 10,000 I mentioned in our database, and uh, something we might talk about later, we're also on a bus tour all across the country talking to reporters in newsrooms in states all over the country to find out how we can help them better. So, what does that really look like? Well, we were able to help a reporter at Bloomberg get that space gene story right. We put her in touch with an epi, uh, epigeneticist who could talk about what was really different about those genomes and what wasn't. We got this reporter from Engadget straightened out so he could write correctly about that so-called newly discovered human organ. Uh, we helped a reporter from the Savannah Morning News who, it turns out, her readership was understandably interested in oil companies' intentions to do some blasts on the continental shelf to look for oil, but there were a bunch of World War II bombs out there on the shelf that had been abandoned. Um, not to mention a nuclear bomb that fell there in 1958 and has never been found. Um, and was that going to pose a risk? We were able to put her in touch with experts in the deterioration, uh, underwater deterioration of munitions, so she could get that story right. Uh, just to blast through the last few uh, examples, in Texas, a reporter wanted to know how come fish in the Gulf were still contaminated with mercury two decades after the Superfund site there had been cleaned up. We put her in touch with ecotoxicologists and fisheries scientists to explain that. A reporter in Arkansas got a hold of records of water analyses for the water supply going to the prison system there and wanted help figuring out how to read those charts, which were filled with jargon, to figure out whether there's a story there about the water quality for those prisons. In Delaware, you might recall this ethylene oxide uh, release from a factory that exploded there that shut down traffic on the Bay Bridge for six hours. And people in her community, of course, wanted to know, was there an explosion hazard or other health hazard from this gas being released? We found her a scientist who actually was in the business of developing a greener method for producing ethylene oxide and who knew uh, a lot about that gas and how it behaves and were able to help that way. And a reporter in California who 
had evidence that a algal bloom was about to start out there and wanted to know what she could or couldn't say about the links there with climate change. And we found her a phytoplankton specialist who specialized in understanding the conditions under which these blooms happen. I'll just end with one last example that I thought was particularly interesting. And this was a reporter who came to us from NBC and he was tracking this inventor who had had a new invention. And he told people that if he took a little bit of DNA from a parent and put it at the end of this rod, he could find their missing child. He went to families where children had gone missing, had been gone sometimes for years, and convinced them that I can find your kid, it's like a dowsing rod, I pick up on the resonance frequency of your kid's DNA and it matches the DNA here. And cops were actually starting to use this guy and families were paying money to go to him and yet there was no published evidence anywhere that it worked. The reporter came to us for help to find an expert who might be able to explain whether this was plausible or not. We put him in touch with a scientist at NIST, the National Institute of, uh, uh, of Standards and uh, Technology, thank you, and um, who had a specialty in bioresonance and frequency uh, sensors. And I can tell you that this story that could have happened did not happen. That story got spiked, and sometimes that's the most important thing we can do. Thanks.